Our second scripture reading for this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 32, verses 21 to 31. 22, I believe, actually, excuse me, 22 to 31. Hear now God's word for you and for all of us today. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. O eternal God, we thank you for this witness from Holy Scripture which we have just read, and for your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our hope, our love, our strength, our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. What's in a name? What's in a name? It's a question asked in one of the most famous scenes of one of the most famous plays of all time. It's from the balcony scene of William Shakespeare's tragedy, Romeo and Juliet. The star-crossed lovers, they come from families that despise each other, so Juliet tries to downplay the significance of their last names, saying, what's in a name? That which we call a rose, by any other name, would smell as sweet. She tries to make the argument that what we call something doesn't really matter. It doesn't define a person or a thing. It doesn't change what it is. Well, unfortunately for her, she finds out that she is wrong. We all know how that story ends. The names of people, places, and things have great significance. Think about last names when we're getting married, right? It's quite common, or at least it was, for women to hyphenate their last names, taking on their husband's last name while still maintaining their own. Others who have gotten married more recently, it seems to be in vogue to retain your maiden name as a second middle name instead of hyphenating your last one. You see, it's not so easy to discard this part of who we are, who we've been. We also fight over the names of places and things, don't we? Think about sports teams that have changed their names. The football team based in Washington, D.C., they changed their name recently to the Commanders after many years of being pushed to drop their original name, which happens to be a racial slur. And growing up, I remember the baseball team in Tampa Bay being called the Devil Rays. You remember the Devil Rays? But 
In 2008, they dropped Devil from their name, and they became just the Rays, a reference to both the Florida Sunshine and the Manta Ray, their mascot. Think, too, about the highest peak in the U.S., originally called Denali by the Native Americans in Alaska, but it was renamed to Mount McKinley in the early 1900s. But after decades of lobbying by Alaskans, the name of the mountain was restored to Denali in 2015. Names are part of identity. This is true in our own lives. It's particularly true in Scripture. It's one of the main themes of our text in Genesis. Names tell us something about the person, place, or thing. I'll give you an example of a place close to my heart, uh, Montreat, right, where McKnight and the youth went this summer. It's a combination of two words, mountain and retreat. So it tells you about the location. It's a mountainous location, and it tells you what its purpose is. It's for refreshment, for retreating from the world. And our passage this morning is about Jacob. His name in Hebrew, Yaakov, it's connected to the Hebrew word meaning to follow, to be behind, as well as the word for heal. You see, it's a reference to his birth along with his twin brother. Jacob is born second, and he comes out holding the heel of his older brother Esau. It's also this older twin brother that assigns Jacob the meaning to supplant, to supplant. You see, these brothers, they have a sibling rivalry. Jacob, he steals Esau's birthright for a bowl of stew, and later Jacob steals a blessing from their father, Isaac, which is meant for Esau. Jacob pretends to be Esau, dressing up in hairy clothing and he receives the blessing instead of Esau. So Jacob, he routinely gets the better of his brother Esau, but he has a more balanced fight with his brother-in-law, or excuse me, his father-in-law, Laban. You see, they strike a deal that Jacob will work for Laban for seven years for Laban's daughter Rachel's hand in marriage. But after serving that time, Laban tricks Jacob and gives to him Laban's other daughter, Leah. Jacob must then work another seven years for Rachel. The deceiver is deceived. But ultimately, though, Jacob has the last laugh. He builds great wealth at the expense of his father-in-law. He makes a deal about how to split up the possession of their rapidly growing flock. So Jacob, in his dealings with others, he's always come out victorious. He always comes out on top. But, and this is a big but, at least in my mind, it comes at the cost of his good name. Jacob is a trickster, a deceiver, He deals deceitfully with others, and they do the same with him in return. And it seems we live in a time where many are willing to muddy their name, throwing out ethics and morals for power and money. Perhaps it's always been that way, but maybe we just hear about it a bit more now. I'm a big fan of soccer. I hope some of you caught the Women's World Cup game this morning. I know, sadly, the U.S. crashed out of the Women's World Cup. Please do watch the highlights, okay? You won't believe the penalty kick that won it for Sweden. You'll you'll understand when you see it. But that's kind of an aside, sorry. Um, I'm a big fan of soccer, as you could tell. Uh, And many famous soccer players have actually recently moved to the professional league in Saudi Arabia, and they've done so for huge sums of money. 
And this is, of course, on the back of what Saudi Arabia has done with Live Golf, and a number of prominent golfers have also taken uh, extravagant money to play for them, and the PGA Tour now has, has combined with them. Um, all involved have sold their reputations to help the Saudis with their quote-unquote sport-washing project. Well, much closer to home, you probably have heard this week about a Naples man accused of swindling $35 million from people here in our community. And sadly, even more sadly, I think, sometimes using church connections to foster trust. Absolutely devastating news for our community and for those affected. I imagine many of those who were taken are wrestling with God over why this was allowed to happen, why church communities didn't do more to stop a wolf in sheep's clothing. Absolutely devastating. Well, now let's finally get to our passage proper. It's where Jacob is preparing to reunite and hopefully reconcile with his brother Esau. He sends his large herds along with his family ahead of him crossing the ford of the Jabbok. And when he is sure everyone has crossed and he is all by himself, he is suddenly plunged into a wrestling match with a stranger. What an interesting happenstance. These foes, they're locked in a struggle against each other for hours. They struggle against each other all night long. And our first clue that this is no ordinary man Jacob is wrestling is that he is able to knock Jacob's hip out of its socket. And so Jacob, too, seems to realize this is someone special, and always being greedy for a blessing, he requests one in exchange for ending the bout. Well, in the end, the stranger does him one better. He not only blesses Jacob, he gives Jacob a new name. He calls him Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans. Well, we've heard how he has striven with humans, so it seems this mysterious figure is either God or some kind of divine emissary. And the former seems to be the preferred reading, for Jacob ends up calling the place Peniel or Penuel, meaning the face of God, which, of course, is where Mission Peniel gets its name, right? The face of God. So you see, in his dealings with other people, Jacob has left a lot to be desired. He has soiled his good name. It is as good as mud. So it seems part of the blessing bestowed upon him from striving with God is a new beginning, a fresh start, a clean slate. He is no longer Jacob the deceiver. He is now Israel, the wrestler. The one who has fought off both humans and God while still living to tell the tale. But, another but, it's important to remember that Jacob is alone when this happens. He's the only one that's aware of this encounter. He's given a fresh start by God, but he must begin to live that out going forward. When he meets Esau, his brother will still know him as Jacob, the one who tricked him and stole from him. So it's up to Jacob slash Israel to show that he is a changed person. A changed person. Well, what then are we to take from this story, this strange wrestling match that Jacob has with God? Well, I, for one, am certainly in awe of his persistence and his fierceness. Jacob is certainly battling above his weight class, right? But he refuses to give up or to give in. For Jacob 
It is in the wrestling that he is wounded. His hip gets knocked out of his socket. Well, in contrast, for many of us, our wounds are what sometimes cause us to wrestle with God, right? Jacob wrestled with God. We wrestle with God at certain points in our lives. We wrestle with God when difficult things happen to us at times when we question our faith. And when those times come, it can be easier to simply walk away, to turn away from God. And many people do make that choice. Perhaps we've made that choice in the past as well. But the better choice is the one that Jacob makes. We, we should follow Jacob's example. Instead of turning away, we should hold on to God with all of our strength. We should refuse to let God go for however long it takes until God relents, until God offers us a blessing as well. Like Jacob, that will be a difficult struggle, but one we should persevere with. Anyone who has suffered real loss knows that it leaves scars. Healing is possible, but there are reminders of what we've been through. For Jacob, it's his limp. Sadly, he didn't live in Naples, Florida with lots of really good hip replacement doctors. Right? But here's what the great biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann says about Jacob. He says, what remains the next morning is the same man, but now decisively changed. He has changed in two ways. First, he has a new name, Israel. And second, he is changed by his new limp. And this is no minor injury. He was wounded by his wrestling with God. Meeting this God did not lead, as we are wont to imagine, to reconciliation, forgiveness, and healing. Instead, it resulted in a crippling. He has penetrated the mystery of God like none before him, and he has prevailed. But his prevailing is also a defeat as well as a victory. This story tends to remind me of the book of Job, one of my favorite in Scripture, right? When bad things happen, we struggle with God. We may have scars. But let's keep that connection open. Let's hold on to God for dear life. At some point in our lives, we all experience something that shakes us. None of us get through this life unscathed. But if we're willing to stick it out with God, if we cling to God and wrestle with our faith in the midst of trying times, it will lead to a deeper faith. It will. It will. Like Jacob, we will be changed. We will be hurt. We will have scars from the fight. But in holding fast to God, we can refuse to let go until finally, finally the day comes when we too are blessed again. May it be so. Amen.